Hi, and welcome to the Gotham Sound live stream, our weekly webcast for everyone out there who's who's listening and watching. Uh, I'm Nick Houston, and today I'm here with uh, Dana Feintuck. Um, and first of all, just one note about the Gotham Sound live stream. Um, we love putting together content from you, but we also want to hear about things that you want to hear about. So if you have any ideas, things you'd like us to do, email us at at uh, info at gothamsound.com. Uh, you can also follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and uh, you know, generally around the neighborhood. Anyway, so without further ado, here's uh, Dana Feintuck. Um, thank you for being here, Dana. My pleasure, thank you for asking me. So a little bit about Dana. Um, she is mostly a reality TV mixer. Um, right. Shows like Real Housewives of New Jersey, The Apprentice, and uh, Survivor. Yes. Right. Yep. Cool. So tell me a little bit about what it's like being a, uh, you know, a reality mixer. Which, what's a day in the life like? A reality mixer is a lot of run and gun. Uh, you have to think on the fly. You have to be ready for anything. Mm -hmm. uh, and you have to deal with a lot of drama uh -huh. um, that is not written. Uh -huh. um, yeah, so there's a lot, of, a lot of people to keep happy when you're uh, being a sound mixer. And basically, the, the best you could do is if you're invisible, you're doing it right. People uh -huh. don't even think about or mention sound. You're doing it right. Cool. Yeah. So, like, you show up, you know, to to set in the in the beginning of the day. What's like the first thing you do? The so day in the life is I usually show up to the tech room, uh -huh. uh, take all my batteries off a of charge, uh -huh. make sure that I know what's going on that day and I have what I need. Like, if we're doing a big scene, if I have enough mics, uh, and that they've told me who's on the mic list. Um, and then I, uh, I basically pack up everything. I try and be as compact as possible and try and have the most important things on my rig itself. Um, there's certain things that I don't want to have to run away for. I want to be able to solve it on the fly. So I always make sure on my person or in my bag I have moleskin or a top stick, batteries, an extra earbud for a producer that can't hear. Um, yeah, anything that could go wrong, I want to have on me. I don't want to ever have to run to a vehicle to go fix a problem. Oh, cool. Yeah. Awesome. And then, yeah, I just uh, I mic the talent up when they're ready. I find the closest chair, if I can, <laughs> if I'm lucky. Uh -huh. um, no, no shame in saving my back. Definitely not. Um, and then, yeah, just mix, press record. Cool. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. And how did you get into sound? I, I fell into sound. I never actually thought that I would be a sound mixer, but I'm happy that I am. It's uh, definitely a, a really great position to have on, on set. Um, I used to be a camera assistant. Mm -hmm. I worked my way up from PA to camera assistant in film and then camera assistant in reality television. And then I took a turn um, when I was kind of sick of PA or ACing for a low rate. Mm -hmm. And so a sound supervisor that I had been working with offered that I could be his A2 and mm -hmm. I could make the same amount of money and run around a lot less and learn about audio. And I was, I was totally keen for that because I think I was kind of stagnant in ACing. I knew what needed to be done and I wanted something fresh. Uh -huh. So then I started to A2 and then I just kept learning more and more, and then I worked my way up to mixer, and now I'm a mixer and supervisor sometimes. Cool. Mm -hmm. And how has any of your work as a sound person been informed by the work you did as an AC? Uh, I think that I am able to help a little bit more um, on set knowing AC things, like where to stand and, and what type of shot they're, they're shooting, um, how close they can get with the boom if need be. Um, and especially in reality, you do a lot of walking, talking shots. So mm -hmm. being able to backpedal for a shooter if the AC is not available, which these days our crews are very um, bare bones. Uh -huh. So I'm able to help backpedal and, you know, I help out in every way, every way. Yeah. Cool. I'm That's all about team playing. It's something that I've learned in past shows is that if you have an extra hand and you're going that direction, take something with you, help someone out because the more you're willing to do for other people, they are willing to be there for you if you need them. Right, and producers love that too. Yes. They're just like, oh, she's, <laughs> she's doing that thing, we're gonna have her come back. Yeah, I'm, I'm one of those that sometimes I like to shout out like l recommendations or questions or what if we did this, and uh -huh. some are open to it and some are just go on their, on right. their way, but yeah. 
And for ACing, you not only did reality ACing, mm -hmm. but you did feature film ACing yeah. too. Mm -hmm. I started off um, working on student films, just helping out, and then I learned how, uh, about the cameras, and I learned how to load film. Mm -hmm. And then one of my first actual jobs out, out of college was I was a loader on a feature film. It was an indie film, I don't think it went anywhere, uh -huh. but it was a really fun job because I got to work out of this camera truck that was an old ambulance, and I had my hands in a bag, and. Yeah, it was it was really fun. I, I working on feature films is very different, and it's uh, grueling in a totally different way. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I can mm -hmm. imagine. Yeah, and I'm, I also imagine that uh, learning the that side of the camera because it's really in depth camera knowledge. Yeah, yeah, they don't make them like they used to. <laughs> True. D digital is great, and and um, it's always changing. But there's something awesome about the way film looks uh -huh. and feels. It's it's just it's got, it's, there's, I think it's deeper. Do you have any of that same nostalgia for like uh, dat tapes, for instance? <laughs> Luckily, I did not come into audio at that point, but I did, when I did start out, it was mixers as opposed to recorders, which are everywhere now. And I do, I'm very grateful for the fact that I did learn on a mixer and know how to handle more than two people's scenes in knowing where to pan my lefts and rights if, um, if we're talking about a scene with four people who's the one that should be isolated because you only had to send to camera and that was your only recording device. So you had to make sure that everything going to the camera was good and that you could at least ISO one or two people. Yeah, so it, it, knowing now that I'm working on a recorder, it's kind of um, like an ease, like you, a weight off your shoulder because if it's bad going to the recorder, like let's say, we start a scene and I fr forget to press record, that which doesn't happens. happen. Yeah. Um, but if it does, I know uh -huh. that it's being sent to camera, so it's not lost. And then if the connection to camera is bad, like if my range is bad or if I get a hit, it's okay because I've got it clean right. and I'm recording. Cool. So tell me about um, you know, tell me about your kit. What's an average, or what, not, a, not an average, average kit, what is your kit? Well, like? I think that it is an average reality kit. Mm -hmm. um, I have a 788 and I have seven wires with a couple of spares in case something goes down. Um, I, I have Sankin uh, COS 11s. Mm -hmm. I have um, four IFBs for producers, um, and I have two uh, camera sends because mm -hmm. it, t it tends to be, if I get hired with my gear, they generally have two cameras. Yeah. Um, and then I have two locket boxes as well because you have to sync it somehow. And are you sending stereo to camera or monitor camera? I send stereo because I have two SRBs, mm -hmm. um, so I can. Um, sometimes they say, oh, scratch track, but I, I, you know, it's on there, so why not send both? Right. Yeah. Who cares? Good point. It doesn't cost me extra. To, there's no, it's just one more XLR going in, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Torture. As opposed to trying to hook up an IFB onto a camera, I'd rather just like put a straddle bag on and, mm -hmm. or slot insert it, yeah, depending on the camera. Oh, yeah, because you can do that with the yeah. SRBs. Cool. Yeah. And then my favorite part of my kit is my harness. Uh -huh. It's just your basic uh, port brace harness, but it's covered in leather. A friend of mine personalized it for me. Um, it's got uh, pockets that hold everything that I would need, like I said, for the quick, mm -hmm. the quick go. I've got a pen that nobody can steal for their time cards. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> a tweaker, because uh -huh. back in the day with the UM 400s, you need it. And a scissor for cutting moleskin. Uh -huh. Um, no, wait, show those scissors again. I know, they're child scissors, but they're really good at cutting moleskin. That's they don't get cute. sticky. And uh, yeah, the, it's, I, you know, you never, you never want to run out of that stuff. Yeah. And then on the other side, I have um, a quick moleskin pouch. It's got moleskin, top stick, any hush lobs, because you, you never know when you're going to yeah. need a hush lob. And it's got a tiny hex key in there, too, for mm -hmm. in case you need to take a clip off of a, a mic. And how did you get? And gum. I mean, that's a you need you need gum. You need fresh true. breath if you're getting in people's faces. That's true. <laughs> so how so. did you get this fancy harness? I worked on a show called uh, uh, Garo Unleashed, and uh, it was a really great show. It was really creative. Like the cast and crew on the show were really amazing. It was something that I hadn't worked on. It was on Sundance Channel. It was really creative. The people who were on the show were just really loving and just creative. I, it was something new for me. Um, and so one of the guys, um, Gerald Vincent, um, offered to make me uh, something cool because I was so jealous of the things that they were making on the show. Uh -huh. So he offered to pimp out my harness. So the back is made out of clock gears, which is kind of his style. And it used to be cooler. I've actually had this for over three years now. Um, but there used to be windy bits on the back that people could wind me up. But 
Yeah, and I like the port brace one because as a female, I have very short shoulders. Uh -huh. I've actually tried to work with the VersaFlex and the, um, before, but oh, like on days... Just hold it up a tiny bit yeah, higher sorry. so that we can all see it. So uh, I, there was one day I forgot this and I had to borrow somebody else's spare uh, harness and it was a VersaFlex and it was the worst day I've ever mixed because oh, no. First of all, it was really broad on my shoulders and it kept slipping off and it was really long. I couldn't make it any tighter on me. So when I was running around with the bag, it was hitting my knees oh. and it was, I had bruises after that day because mm -hmm. it was just the most uncomfortable thing. This one can get tight for my frame and the shoulders are just what I need. So, so very so important. Lesson, this is my most important piece of uh -huh. gear. So the lesson is never, ever forget your harness. I know. And now I have a spare. <laughs> oh, cool. Yeah. Just is it as case. fancy as that? No, it's no. just a basic. It's a naked one. Cool. <laughs> yeah. So tell me a little bit about working on uh, Survivor and Apprentice, because those are obviously big shows. Like, how, how big is the crew? How big is the sound crew? Yeah. What, are you, what are you looking at there? Well, um, they're two very different shows. And I kind of came up in the bigger show. Like, my first reality show was a Mark Burnett show. And I had done, like, six Mark Minette shows consistently when I got into the reality world. Um, the, the audio crew on Survivor, are, they're kind of split. Half of them do the challenges in the reality and then half do just the real, uh, sorry, challenges in tribal and then the other half just do reality. Um, so the reality crew have it really hard because they're out in the elements, like whether it's raining, whether it's pouring, whether it's sunny, whether there's mosquitoes and bugs, they're out there working working really hard and their rig is really simple because the way that the survivors live is very real this is one of the the realest reality show i've ever worked on what you see is really what's happening and they're not given anything so the audio crew they have uh, i worked as a audio tech on that show for many years so i would set up their rigs and um it's just a simple 302 with a boom uh, it's got an MKH-70 and a Zeppelin with a dead cat. And they're sending one channel to the cameras and one channel to IFB. It's that simple. Um, we have to make everything waterproof because, again, if it's raining, you're still shooting. There's no cut. Mm -hmm. um, so everybody has a rain cover, but also you have to think about the rain, the rain cover on the camera. Sometimes it doesn't always protect it. So we would waterproof the hops, and we would take this clear piece of plastic hole punch where the antennas are, wrap it around the 411s, mm -hmm. rubber band it with an O-ring, or with a, it was a, we would cut a bike tube in slits, oh, stretch that out over it, so the top was covered, and then we would put O-rings around the antennas and then put the antennas on, so they were very waterproof, cool. and it was, it was, came in handy. I don't think we ever had a receiver go down. But it was really fun working on that show be, as a, a tech because it let me open things up. And even though I couldn't really fix it because I don't know the circuitry, but there were times where I would like bring a, a mic or a transmitter back to life if it took a dunk in the ocean. Oh, wow. uh, if you get it in fresh water fast enough, you might be able to save it. So what, you just dunk it in fresh water and then what happens? Yeah, so we would have, at the tribe camps, we have like a tech room tent. And we would always leave a bucket there that had uh, fresh water in it. So in case that they dunked their mixer or their mic or whatever, they would just put it in fresh water and let it sit there. Obviously, take the batteries out if it was a, right. an IFB or whatever. Um, and then they would bring it to me, and I would air it out. I'd open it up, dry it out, and then I would put it in a bag full of silica gel. We would have these buckets of silica gel packets, and I would just dunk it in there, let it sit for three days, let it really dry out and then I would have some deoxid um, that is like anti-rust um, mm -hmm. stuff and if I saw any rust actually I would put that on before I put it in the bucket um, just to try and fight any of the acid that might mm -hmm. occur and then sometimes I was able to bring things back and it was nice cool but yeah, yeah you, you awesome. learn a lot about um, the elements yeah <laughs> yeah and, and then, then as far as apprentice goes it's a your standard reality show, um, we would build, I think we had like 20 uh, mixers on that show, so we would build those and we would have to, I think we would have two different blocks, mm -hmm. it's, it's been a while since I've been an A2 on that show, um, we would have two different blocks for the teams and then we would have to run ahead because on that show in the beginning they would just run anywhere they wanted and so you had to be ready and ahead of them, like if they wanted to see the executives at any moment's notice, 
you couldn't just go ahead. You had to go right when they were going. Mm -hmm. So we would have to hurry up and get there before them, mic the executives, and then stay back and demic the executives, and then try and ahead, jump ahead and try and beat them to their next location if it was something that needed miking. And then you'd ha obviously have to do a midday battery change right. for everybody. So there were, but there were twenty mixers working on that show. I at believe any given so. Time? I think it went up to the letter T. Or wow, yeah, that's a huge crew. Yeah. yeah. Well, because you you need to cover them the whole day. Right. So you start off with like a 5 a.m. shift, and then you, back in the day when it was regular people, we would shoot them nonstop. Mm -hmm. Now it's Celebrity Apprentice, so they are ours kind of hours because they don't do the whole thing. But back in the day, they would live in a loft, and you would they would always be shot. So you needed crews to shoot the whole day. And then also they can split up, so you have two teams, and then the two teams can split up into teams of two or three. So you need to be ready to go anywhere. Wow, mm -hmm. that's interesting. Yeah, it was a fun show. Cool. Yeah. Um, so tell me about, um, I don't know, a, a, a learning experience you had on set. Learning experience. Um, this is a rule that I live by, and I learned it uh, working with my awesome friends on Survivor. Is um, Rule number one is um, never separate yourself from your stuff, mm -hmm. which is a big one, because you never know where where you're, again, reality is very run and gun, so you work out of a minivan or a 15 pass a lot of the time. And you need to make sure that you need to make sure that your stuff is on hand for uh -huh. whatever. Like you never know, a, a, a cast member could show up at a scene and they're like, "Oh, quick, we need this person mic'd," and you were like, "Oh, well, I only brought three in with me." You need to make sure that you have it on hand, and you never know in these productions when they might send that van to go refill up or gas or go pick up lunch or whatever. So. Always just keep your stuff with you. Know where your stuff is at all times. Even your personal stuff. Like if you leave your backpack in a, in a van and all of a sudden that van disappears, um, you don't want to be without your stuff. So right. yeah. always know where your stuff is and have it close by. Cool. Mm -hmm. I like that. Did that ever happen to you once? Um, or you learned no, that? No, I yeah. think I learned it. I, don't, I, I mean, it might have happened, but um, nothing that sticks out. And then always, yeah, always keep your eye on your stuff. This is not audio related, but it's a story that I always tell any AC. I was working on a show, and we were working out of 15 pass, and I was, uh, people were loading in and out. I was inside, but in the 15 pass, our production, our production person was standing at the front door open of the 15 pass, leaning on the, the seat, doing paperwork. The AC was loading stuff in the back, put the camera on the front bench, and then kept loading stuff, and somebody just walked up right into the van with the person standing at the front seat and just yoinked it out and walked away. So always, like, at least just close the door. Wow. Just close the door. Yeah, That's so I tell every AC I work with that story because, like, it stuck with me. Right. Was that in New York? Mm-hmm. Yeah. It was right in, like, the East Village, just daylight, nothing, nothing out of the way, and somebody standing right there, just, like, just with the seat blocking their view was enough time for them to just take it. Yeah. So people yeah. are pretty bold. That's yeah, so crazy. I'm very protective of my gear. Like I, I'm never. It's never out of my sight. Yeah. So rule number one. Rule number one. You yeah. Separate yourself from your stuff. Exactly. Yeah. Wow. Cool. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, you know, any what's your you know either funniest or most interesting story that you have from from set life? Okay. When you first told me about this question, you said most embarrassing. Okay. Oh Sorry. no, you did say funny. Funny. Oh, you did funny say or funny. interesting? Okay. Well, the the story that I have prepped, I'm gonna go with embarrassing because right. it's funny. Um, uh, a, a really long time ago, a year ago, um, I was working on a show and it was winter and we had this scene where people were talking out on the street corner of their neighborhood and that at one point one of them was going to run back home real fast. And um, what happened was, and the thing is that I knew I would have range from here to their driveway, mm -hmm. but the camera guys obviously go with them and start running with them um, to, to get the shot, I probably would have had range, so I probably didn't need to run, I could have walked, but for, I wanted to be, you know, like them and, mm -hmm. you know, keep my, my agility up. So I started to run, and then I, in order to avoid a light shadow, ran like along a lawn that was covered in snow. And I guess that there was a ditch that I didn't see, so, but it was a really great fall. I fell. Um, uh -huh. But it was a really great fall because it's one of those falls where you realize that you're falling but and you're at about a 45 degree angle but for a good 10, 15 feet you're like, oh, I'm falling, I'm falling, I'm falling and there's nothing you can do to like get straight up again. So I fell and I did a complete like barrel roll over myself and the mixer, <laughs> a big 788 bag. And um, 
And what's funny is that people who saw, and this was at nighttime, mind you, um, people who saw, like, after we, we wrapped, they're like, are you okay? I was just like, I saw lights, and then I didn't see lights anymore. Uh, and then when I got up, I was okay. Uh, when I got up, I looked and saw if my, like, levels were off, but the, everything stayed. Everything so was fine. I can fall down and still still do a good so job. So wait, did you, like, face plant in the snow? I, um, I did... What was a I roll? Don't, I don't think it was not a face plant. My face didn't hurt. My knee hurt. Okay. So I think I was like this, and then finally my knees just went, and then I toppled over. Some tumbling? Yeah, oh I did my some, gosh. some tumbling. Um, but it was really funny. And what I notice about me is when I do things embarrassing, I just tell people about it to uh -huh. kind of avoid the embarrassing. So people who didn't even see it, I was like, oh my God, you will never believe I fell. I fell. Uh, just so <laughs> that they, like, so that I could give the news. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was silly. But it was funny. That's cool. Yeah. How how heavy are those bags anyway? I actually just weighed it the other day. Uh -huh. um, I have um, <laughs> I have three four uh, elevens and two SRBs in uh -huh. my bag because as I was building my kit, the SRBs came out, and I was like, oh, let me let me try these out, and if I don't like them, I can always go back. Right. And I do like them because um, I like the four elevens because obviously the two antennas, like it's a better you have better range mm -hmm. rather than one per channel. Um, but it does lighten my load, and it also creates a, a nice gap in my bag that I can put extra MP1s and my AA batteries um, and phone charger because everybody needs uh -huh, <laughs> an external uh -huh. battery. Yep. Yeah. So, um, uh, yeah, so, oh, so, I, yeah. so I weighed it the other day, actually, and it's about 24 pounds. Wow. Yeah, so okay. it's pretty heavy. But again, I... I'm putting that on me because I want to make sure I have everything on me. I don't right. need to carry like so many empty ones, but I do. And, you know, I'd rather have it on me. And I think that I can handle the weight because I always say that women are meant to carry weight this way. True. So lucky me, knock, knock, uh, no back problems. Um, and I, uh, I, I just think that it's like preparation for pregnancy. <laughs> I don't plan on getting pregnant, but yeah. Me neither. <laughs> um, do you, are there any exercises that you do or are you just like, you're in the bag so much that your back is just Usually, I, you know, when the holidays come about, I don't work very often. Um, so when I do come back after the new year, it's, it, it takes a little bit. Like, and really it's not my lower back, it's just shoulders and the harness that, that when I get back into it, that, that's a little sore. But no, I don't really, I don't really, I mean, I try and stretch and do a little yoga, but Nothing specifically to take care of my back. Maybe I should. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. I don't know. Yeah. I don't either. Um, cool. Well, is there anything? Uh, do you have any tips or tricks or anything that you think people should know um, about? I think that you know you're doing a good job when you never hear waiting on sound. Because uh -huh. that is a very common joke or a reality for some people. But I think you're doing a good job if nobody's waiting on you. And I've, I've had a couple of people that I've miked. And, they, and then like five minutes later, they'll come up to be like, oh, will you mic me? And it's like, I already did. And they're like, oh my God, I didn't even feel it. So I, I pride myself in, in having speed in miking and then also like doing it right the first time so you don't have to keep interrupting because you know it, it can be a little annoying if you have to keep adjusting. It happens, I do mm -hmm. it. But it's nice when you can just get the sweet spot right the first time. Right, and you said you're using Sankins, right? Yeah, I use Sankins with a moleskin sandwich, mm -hmm. and then occasionally, if I need to, a Hushlov. Cool. Yeah. So you just have your your go your bag of tricks to go to and yeah. pick which one. Mm -hmm. And I always um, this is another uh, tip that I've learned from my awesome people on on Survivor. Um, always uh, never screw f future self. So at the end of the day, let's say you used all six of your mics, uh -huh. prep them again that night so that morning Dana. I was feeling good about past Dana. I love Thanks, that. Thanks, past Dana. Thanks, past Dana. Yeah. That's fantastic. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's good to have. Cool. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, let's see. Oh, so Stephen McCreary asked, how do you handle field notes and sound reports during a reality shoot with so many files to send a post? That's a good question. Seems like it could be a nightmare. It could be a nightmare. It depends on the show. If obviously, if you're not party dialing, which means switching frequencies as you're recording, mid-record, then you're okay. You, you have enough time to name the tracks. But on big party events where you do have a full bag and your partner, another mixer, also has a full bag, it, um, it can get crazy. So what I used to do uh, and still do is that I wouldn't name my tracks unless I knew that I was keeping those people. Um, see, it's... it's 
big events are really hard because you want to give posts what they want. You want to be like, okay, on my bag I have person A, B, C, D, and E. And then on that bag you're going to find e, B, you know, the rest of the people. Um, but it doesn't always work out that way because sometimes your crew is sent to chase off this other person and then you get out of range of your people and then it gets chaotic. So what I would do is I would always just have a notepad or a phone, now we can do it on our phones, and just say like I would write down at the time code like at 2138 track B switches to Nick and at you know anytime I switched who was on what track and then I would just email it to post and apologize for not being able to keep uh -huh. people. But I always create a sound report at the end of the day if I have the luxury of naming each track. Mm -hmm. And then they shouldn't need any other notes other than that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. They don't, they don't really care about there was an airplane at, yeah. at whatever because it's like... No. Especially that's the other thing was with reality it's a little more lenient as far as sound interruptions. You know, it's reality. You're in a restaurant. It's going to be loud. Or you are walking on the street. There is an ambulance. Like you want to stop for that stuff. But it, some shows don't let you. Some, some shows just want it to be real reality. So it is what it is. Mm -hmm. Do they ever give you any, um, any feedback as to the location? Like if you get to a place and you're like, God, you guys, this is crazy. It's unfortunate that it, that's one of the hardest part is that when they do scout a scene or call a scene and the audio is very forgotten. People look at as far as, oh, does it look nice? And do we have access? And and what, do we have people on hand that can help us? But they always tend to forget about audio, and so I've definitely been in situations where people have picked a location and it's right next to, uh, let's say, a wine cooler, and there's uh -huh. nobody else in the room, so it's not like uh, a background noise or atmosphere crowd can cover it, it's there. Right. And that's our only option. So there's nothing I can do, my hands are tied. Mm -hmm. I don't have the power to veto a location and be like, no, we're not shooting here. Mm -hmm. You know, not in reality television. Right. Um, and then, you know, a lot of times you're doing interviews and, and there's a lawnmower that goes by and you have to stop for that. But it's just, it's the way the, way the world is, is that yeah. sometimes you just have to be like, listen, there's nothing I can do. My hands are tied. I can't. Yeah, you just yeah. let them know and you're like. Just like, it's bad. Yeah. <laughs> sometimes, another popular thing is that like producers say, oh, is, is that like, Drilling going to be really bad? Uh, yes. You know it is. I don't know why you're asking me. Yes, it is. Yeah. So. They just want you to say it's okay. Exactly. And I'm not. Yeah. In most cases, I, I won't lie. There's like, it's like this weird balance of, I think every mixer differs. And what point are you willing to say it's okay and then not okay? You know, like, mm -hmm. who's really sensitive and who's just like, okay, I know that this, we only have this block of time with this person. It's livable. Mm -hmm. You know? So. Yeah. So you kind of base it on, on the production's needs yes. in addition to like what your quality yeah, standards are. Yeah, like are. if we have the ability to do it over again or, or to like wait until after lunch or depends on if the sound is somebody lawn mowing, you know they're going to be done in 20 minutes. Right. If it's a, a constant like construction that's going to go on all day long and it's like a, something that you know you can get again, uh, right. it's, every opportunity is different. Right. Cool. Yes. All right, let me just check the thing. Yeah. All right, I think we're good. Anything else you want to say? No, this is You're brilliant, of course. No, you are. I love shopping at Gotham. You guys are great. <laughs> <laughs> That's not, I'm, I'm being real. It's like I always come here for, the, for anything that I need, and everybody is so warm and inviting. Well, thank you. And, well, and thank you again for being here, Dana. Um, just so you know, I was one of the first people we talked to about doing this kind of interview. And so she's had a lot of creative input into what we, what we do and what we ask. And so thank you for that. And there'll be some more Dana ideas coming up in future <laughs> webcasts. Um, so anyway, thank you again for being here. Thank you. Um, next week, Tuesday, January 26th, we will have um, some cool new Betso stuff with Jan Zestera. Uh, you can watch this and other videos again at vimeo.com slash Gotham Sound. You can follow us on the Facebook and the Twitter. And if you have any ideas uh, for future things, email us at info at Thank you very much, and thank you again, Dana. Thank you, Nick.